So we're continuing our study through Romans, and um, we're in Romans 11, and I just want to um, I want to read the first five verses of chapter 11 to kind of get us started back on on track here. Um, and uh, so if you stand with me, Romans 11, verse 1, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life? But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Lord, thank you for your word. And again, we pray that your word would be that lamp to our feet and light to our path and that sword in our hand, gripping, gripped by our heart to do battle against the enemy. So we just ask, Lord, that, that you, Holy Spirit, would teach us and lead us in truth. So thank you again that you have given us your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You can all be seated. So Paul, he, he makes very specific what's important is what God says. And he says that in verse 4. But what does the divine response say to him? And so this should really be our whole concern, really not the volumes of books written on every subject imaginable about what God thinks and what God says and their take on it, their opinion of it. You know, some of the stuff that some of these theologians come up with, you could never come up with if you just stuck to the Word of God. It's amazing. Many people can get sucked into that. Not that there aren't good books out there, study tools. I always say good word study books, good history books. Um, but once you start getting into theology books, you have to beware. And then also when you get into commentaries, you have to keep your guard up as well. And so nothing wrong with that, but you have to check everything with the word of God. And so... There are those volumes written on what's wrong or right or false or true about the word. And I say that that comes or should come from the word itself. <laughs> and, and so how about knowing what's true by hearing it as Paul says what the divine response is and that is by the word itself. And so... God's word rightly divided. If I could get you to just think about that for a moment. And as I've said in the past, if I as your pastor, if I only had you for just a little season, if you left here knowing that rightly dividing the word means that you find out what the meaning of the word is in the language, and then you study it that way. And I would be successful as a pastor and so we're to learn God's word that way and someone once said and of course I've repeated many times if you want to hear God speak audibly then read the word out loud and uh, and I repeat it because I believe that and so this is why that we study the whole counsel of God and sometimes I feel like, well, maybe you don't need to be continually reminded of that, but at the same time, maybe we do. Or maybe somebody that really haven't thought of it like that before. I know repetition is the way I learn. 
but we've studied the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, every verse, every chapter, every book, and we took 14 years the first time, and now we're going through again. But you see, God's word is in the whole counsel of his word. <clears throat> and, and so by doing so, then we learn the character of God, and we don't just play our favorite one tune or whatever that keeps us happy because we're prone to do that. And so we don't want to do that. And so we get here to Romans chapter 11 and last time looking at verses 1 through 5. Oh, by the way, the, the uh, title of this message is uh, Free Agent. And... Last, uh, last time in Romans, the title was, Is God a Deserter? And the obvious answer to that we saw in verse 1, absolutely not. God will never cast off his people. That's a character trait of the Lord. He made a promise. He's sticking to it. Because when you think of deserter, it means breaking a promise no longer being faithful to your word, backing out, you know. The character trait of, a de of one deserting is, you know, unfaithful, undependable. Is that our God? No. Our God is faithful and holy and true and trustworthy. And he remains the same and he never changes. And so God's covenant to Israel is an everlasting covenant. We just read that in Psalm 105. Many places. It says that in the word. And in verse 5 of our text, it says there really that there's no different in, in our day because Paul writes, even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, when he writes this present time, he's not talking about the day in which he was penning the words, but he speaks of the church age. In this time, there's a remnant. And God is faithful to that remnant. And he, promise, he promises always that there is a remnant and there always has been when you study through history and so the promises have always been for the remnant to believers or those who will believe because God will do a work in Israel where eyes will be opened one day and we see that if you compare just uh, Romans 11, 26, and 27 here in the same chapter where it says, And so Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away <clears throat> their sins. And then one chapter back, in chapter 9, verse 27, it says, and this is Isaiah, who cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And so keep in mind regarding the subject of Israel that the Apostle Paul, remember, also in the same context of chapters 9, 10, and 11, dealing with how this all works out for Israel, the whole gospel, the work of God, the New Testament, chapter 9, Israel in the past, chapter 10, Israel in the present, chapter 11, Israel in the future. How does this all work out? The Apostle Paul 
He made it clear in Romans 9, 6 through 8, where he says, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called, that, this, that, that is, those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. So he made it very clear that all that others would consider Israel are not true Israel. And so the Israel, that's the remnant, will be spiritual Israel, believers, of which even the church could be looked at in the sense of spiritual Israel, believers. In other words, true Israel are those who have relationship with God. And so Paul is spelling this out very clearly. He has that one directive. And then if you remember there, he used Elijah as an example. And if you remember, Elijah was this amazing prophet of God in the Old Testament who God used mightily, but then after this mighty working that Elijah was part of, he fled in, in fear of the woman Jezebel who threatened his life. And then when he finally got to a place far away from where he started running for his life in a cave, God says, Elijah, what are you doing here? Well, don't you know I'm the only one that stands for you? And, you know, when he says some lame excuse, and God says, no, I've reserved for myself 7,000 that have not bowed their knee. Point being is Elijah, this amazing prophet, missed it all together concerning the remnant. How could that be that he would miss it all together? But he was Elijah the prophet and didn't see it. And so today, as it stands, many men of God, many believers, they miss it. They're missing it. How could that be? And many of them take that position of recognizing Israel as being, or the church as replacing Israel, as if God outcast his people, no longer no longer fulfilling the promise through Israel, you know, and it has the buzzword, well, that's called the replacement theology. What's replacement theology? The church has taken Israel's place. Israel is cast out, and God's no longer fulfilling his promise through Israel. Well, that's convenient to dealing with so many passages that speak about, you know, the tribulation time and so forth where you know um, you know where it's relating that you know God is going to be faithful to Israel and they immediately say well that's speaking of the church because the church has taken Israel's place and so that's one but also there's another false teaching and that is post tribulationists that believe the church is going to go all the way through the tribulation well you see they also have to believe in replacement theology because so many scriptures are dealing with speaking of God's people in tribulation well that's true Israel will be going through the great tribulation but not the church and so replacement theology sort of protects their whole you know, ideas on that. But the Bible is very clear that the church is not going to go through the great tribulation, not appointed to the wrath of God. And so, you know, that's why it's important that we understand these kinds of things and also as we're going to deal with the subject of election. Now, election is a subject that a lot of people steer away from because it's so controversial in the church. As a matter of fact, looking at some systematic theology books, some of them don't even deal with it. It's too hot of a subject. But we're going to touch on it. And so when you look there at verse 6, 
It says, and if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. And, you know, basically it needs to be one or the other. Because grace then excludes the work approach, but remember, Israel was entrenched in the works approach. And then he says, verse 7, What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. And so Israel, by works, hadn't attained a right standing with God, but the elect who are by grace that they have by the gospel of grace attained it. That's his idea. But the rest were blinded. And so the rest were blinded in their, what would be their continual struggle to work for their religion or their merit and not by grace. And so just as it is written God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And so where it says there, God has given them a spirit of stupor, that would mean unbelieving Israel. A spirit of stupor. In response or as the end result of one who would be believing Israel, unbelieving Israel is given that spirit of stupor. And you know, Jesus explains that really well in one passion, pass, passage of scripture. When you look uh, at uh, Matthew 13, where it says in 14 and 15, And in them, this is Jesus, and in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you, you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. And you could see the option that they would be healed by not closing their ears, closing their eyes. And then where in verse 15 it says that they have grown dull grown dull you keep putting it off and closing it off then pretty soon you know that's what you have and i love the way the king james bible says it where it says there that they had wax gross i thought how perfect thinking of the english language waxed gross because i don't know if you've ever had wax in your ears but it's gross, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and every once in a while that had happened to me, and what I usually do is I, at first I kind of feel it coming on, and then by ignoring it, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse, and pretty soon it's like I could barely hear. I gotta deal with this. Then you get the old plunger, And you get the peroxide or whatever, your solution. And you do all that. And sure enough, it's like liberating when that big wax ball comes out of your ear. (laughs) Wax gross, you know. But, you know, it it takes that effort, if you will. Otherwise, if you just keep ignoring it, keep ignoring it, keep ignoring it, pretty soon you'd be deaf. And when you look at the whole principle of back in Exodus, if you look from like chapter 7 to 14, right in there, you'll see God hardening the heart of Pharaoh. But that's not after God would continue try to 
get Pharaoh's participation. But eventually, you know, he just granted Pharaoh his desire so that his heart would harden and God's people would move on so he wouldn't be so fluctuating. But Pharaoh got exactly what Pharaoh wanted. And so, you know, when you see this passage here in Matthew, that where it says the people have grown dull and eyes they have closed, see that process? Lest they should, that's the idea, lest they should so that I would heal them. If they would believe, they wouldn't shut their ear. They wouldn't close their eye. They'd participate. And so when you see that in Scripture where it talks about God blinding or God giving them a spirit of stupor and those kinds of things, it has nothing to do with God blowing them off without acknowledging anything about the individual. God's gospel goes forth into the world. And so, then in verse 9, um, Paul continues, and David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. And then again, let their table, unbelieving Israel, that should be a table of fellowship with God, instead it becomes just a table of ritual and religion. Let it be a recompense. It becomes judgment. You know, and as it would for anybody who would just blow off that fellowship with God, that it would become judgment. Then he says, verse 10, let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. And so once again, and let their eyes be darkened, unbelieving Israel. So when you see that, it's never a blanket statement against Israel that God has suddenly closed, closed you know, his relationship with Israel. But also we know that it's really going to be a temporary condition on many that their eyes are darkened. But God has been working in the Gentile nation since this situation is, it exists. And, you know, we, we see that. I think it's even in verse 25 of, of this chapter where Paul later writes, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. And blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. And you see, so blindness in part until... Because Israel's eyes will be opened in that time set. But in the meantime, God has been working with the Gentiles. And so whenever you see that subject of spiritual blindness in context, remember the golden rule of Bible interpretation? You compare Scripture with Scripture. You don't see this and then suddenly turn to you know, a, co- a commentary written by Calvin <laughs> to find out what blindness means or stupor, only to find out that, oh, we'll get into that in a little bit here, getting ahead of myself. But no, you turn to the Word of God, you compare Scripture to Scripture to find out what that means. Is God's character suddenly, you know, f- for his love for people and the gospel message suddenly slain you know, in the pages of Calvin, the character of God, as Calvin writes his volumes, much more than what the Bible has in it, his volumes. You know, it reminds me of the religious leaders who had 600 and something laws they came up with. You know, the Bible just has a few. Jesus reduced, reduced them, them to two. Men will always complicate things, but we need to remember to keep it simple. And so, and so the election of grace, verse 5. Notice first that it is of grace. You know, there's no other kind of election. 
There is no election of non-grace. We have to remember that. That's simple enough. So I'm taking this very, this very controversial subject. I'm just trying to make it real, in real simple terms, you know. Uh, I had pages and pages and pages of notes. I was telling somebody. I had, this, I had a, stacks of them and piles, and I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm not teaching a college course on election. So I had to just start eliminating and eliminating and just getting down to just the few simple terms that would just help us to understand. Because what is grace? I like the acronym, God's riches at Christ's expense, right? G-R-A-C-E. Easy to remember. Election by grace, unmerited favor. So no one can earn it. Why? Because those who are elected by grace are saved. That's why you can't earn it. And that's why it's by grace. In other words, those who are elected are born again believers. Elected by grace. So that would be number one. Election is connected, linked with the gospel according to grace. That's another important bit. The word, the, the Greek word election, ekloga, chosen, it means chosen. The act of picking out or choosing the action of God's free will by which before the foundation of the world, he decreed his blessings to certain people. And the first thing you have to ask yourself is why certain people? Important. What prompted God to make a distinction between one person and another person? That's an important question to ask. And remember, this is all before the foundation of the earth. This was going on in the mind and the heart of God. And based on what? Don't say random selection. You're not an evolutionist. Because that's where you'd have to land if you said that. Or bias because God's bias or randomly like putting numbers in a lotto machine and going like this and picking them out and that person's elected and that person's not, really? Is that how God works? If you think that way, you'd think like <laughs> Stephen Hawking's. If you heard his last great ideas, you know, the famed physicist, right? Atheist, of course who has to come up with, well, what happened before evolution? You know, and if you looked at this stuff, you would think this is the most bizarre thing I've ever heard. And this is the, you know, the renowned scientist of the world who says that there was time before time and everything then was just a big ball intertwined. And this is before the Big Bang Theory. This is the way it was. So that when it exploded, and that's how it all came into existence. And when I was reading on it, it was five days ago in USA Today. And it said there, uses, he uses an ec Euclidean approach to quantum gravity to describe the beginning of the universe, Hawking's goes deep. Check this out. A degree in astrophysics would be needed to understand what happened 14 billion years ago. I thought, twilight zone? <laughs> and the world takes notes. Are you serious? Are you, am I that foolish? A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And then I go, what in the heck is this Euclidean uh, approach to quantum gravity that he used? And so when I looked up to it, it was pulling from the information of a scientist from Greece 300 BC. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. 
Now you're pulling from a guy from 300 B.C. But if you don't look up this stuff, it just sounds so good. These guys are so smart. So we need to get our answers from the Word of God. So how did God elect? Randomly? <laughs> you know, did he elect us just by bias? Also, election is the, the decree made from choice by which God determined to bless certain persons through Christ by grace alone. Comparing Scripture to Scripture, Ephesians 2.8 tells us, clarifies that it's through faith. Because it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith is part of the equation. And remember, you can never separate election from the gospel. You can't do it. Why would God do it? Gospel is necessary. Why would God have ever separate election from the gospel? Wouldn't happen. It would be contradictory to the whole message, the scarlet thread through the entire Bible, which is Jesus Christ. As a lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. This was all in place. And so, as we see, it is a selection process, and specifically that God chose some over others. Why? And it was before we existed. Chose us before we existed. Hmm, okay, that's true. But why? Why? Knowing God is fair and just and holy, a God of love, what explains this? These are the answers that we have because the Bible tells us. And so this doctrine has been presented in such extreme ways to include some being saved regardless of their response to the gospel, regardless of their manner of living, they were elected by God. And, and, and that, you know, those God happened to not choose that are eternally lost and the gospel never was an option for them. This is what some teach. So these extreme positions, you might know about them, called the doctrine of unconditional election, which says the elect are chosen completely apart from any repentance and faith on their part. What? This is what is taught. And, and also limited atonement that Christ did not die for all mankind, but only for those who he chose. Now, I've got all kinds of problems with those two doctrines that are taught. Because of why? Why? Because of what I've heard? No, because of what the Bible says. And that's our only authority. You could get so messed up by reading volumes of those people that try and convince you of these kinds of doctrines when you just turn to the Bible. I don't have much time, so I'm going to move quicker. But there are verses such as these guys probably won't be able to keep up with me, but it's important that I just, you can, you know, write them down or listen later. So Romans 10, 9, where it says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. John 1, 12, as many as received him, he gave the right to be the children of God. In John 3, 16, Speaking of, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe, right, should not perish but have everlasting life. And God our Savior, 1 Timothy 2, 4, who desires what? All men to be saved. <clears throat> hmm. He does, but doesn't he really mean he desires only those that he's elected? That's not what it says. They have to twist it to mean that, though. Otherwise, it is contrary to their whole ideology. And then, Revelation twenty two seventeen, Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. 
And then First uh, Peter chapter 1, verses 23 through 25, who when he was reviled, did not revile, revile in return. Wrong verses. Sorry. Where am I at? Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And so we're born again by the gospel word preached. And so as the word goes forth. And then also that believing you might have life, John 20, verse 31. And so that's just a few of them. And my point, of course, is in the regard to election. And Thiessen writes this on what is election. He says that election is that sovereign act of God in grace whereby he chose in Christ Jesus for salvation all those whom he foreknew would accept him, unquote. Now, this is where the next important aspect comes into view, and that is election by grace happened before the foundation. We've established that. The foundation of election is in Christ, who was slain before the foundation of the earth, and only Christ alone can provide the righteousness man would need. And so, remember, God would not choose us in himself, but we are chosen or elected in Christ. That's the gospel, that we are in Christ. In Romans 8, 28 through 30, it tells us for for whom he foreknew, he predestined. And then in 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, it says that we are the elect according to the foreknowledge of God. And so basically, God in his foreknowledge, he's looking forward to events happening like we look back to events that have happened course the difference is is God's knowledge is perfect and ours is not so he always gets it perfectly right but our memory will often fail us but you get the point in perfect clarity and there in Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 5 where it says blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that he should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And so... That's how God has elected us by his foreknowledge. And of course, none of us could be in Christ unless Christ came and died and finished it. And until then, we couldn't be in Christ. And also, it would by God's foreknowledge seeing this perfectly taking place and being able to commit to such a great sacrifice before he even created us. So every every man is urged to repent and receive Jesus Christ as Savior, Hebrews 2.9. He tasted death, it says, for every man. And then also in Acts 17.30, now commands all men everywhere to repent. And then also, aren't we given the great commission as believers? where it tells us in Mark 16, 15, and 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and so is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. See, there is a responsibility that God puts upon man. 
And it's so beautifully seen in John chapter 15 because some would quote, you might have heard this, John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. And so, and I don't have time to go over John 15, but let me say it this way in a nutshell. If you study John 15 in context, remember, 2020, read 20 verses before, 20 verses after to find out the meaning of the text. In the context of John 15, it is about abiding in Christ. It is about an earthly ministry of being fruitful here as he speaks to his disciples whom he elected. You did not choose me, he told his disciples, that select group. I chose you. As a matter of fact, as a proof text to that, in Luke um, 6, it tells us, um, Luke 6, verse 13, and when it was day, he, Jesus, called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. And so from the many disciples, he chose 12. And you see, this is the reference to what he's also talking about here in John 15, that I have chosen you, now, you have not chosen me. Well, at that point, no, they didn't. They didn't know what to think about him. But they did not, you did not choose me yet because they did choose him. As a matter of fact, after the resurrection, John 20, he breathed the Spirit into them and then they became born again. The Spirit indwelled them at that point. It wasn't until later that they waited for the Spirit to come upon them, which was a completely different movement of the Spirit in their lives. But first, they were born again. So no, at that point in time, no, they didn't choose Him. But you can see how, by God's foreknowledge, and if you go back to John 13, it says, not all of you are clean. By His foreknowledge, He knew that one of them was a devil, Judas, not all of you are clean, but you will be. And so here you see the perfect election of God worked out in the temporal realm as Jesus, by his foreknowledge, chose his disciples, knowing what they would do, that they would become the apostles of the church. And God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. James, there's no shadow of turning with God. I'm not like man that I would change, God says, Malachi 3, 6. I'm not a man that I'd change. And so we can trust that God, by his spirit, can work in each and every life, and also we can trust that we do have a mission, a great commission of bringing the good news and how beautiful on the feet are those who bring the good news. And there's a wonderful picture there. Yes, God is sovereign. Yes, God knows who it is that will make a decision to follow him. Yes, he did choose and elect us. But the gospel went forth, and we embrace it by faith. Amen? Amen. All right, let's stand together. I know that was a lot, but, <laughs> you know. Uh, so... I encourage you to hang out in fellowship because we don't get enough of it. Jesus was all about fellowship. Jesus was all about food and fellowship. I always say my favorite thing. You know, so. So Lord, um, thank you so much for your work among us and thank you for your love within our hearts. And we thank you that uh, we're new creatures in Christ and old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. We want to thank you that we can uh, serve you in the power of the Spirit. Lord, help us to grow in our faith and to get together as much as possible, not forsaking the gathering of the brethren, knowing, Lord, not only do we need each other, but, Lord, that uh, others need our gifting as well. And 
we need uh, that, you know, coming together for encouragement and to hear from you. And, um, and Lord, to be strengthened in that way. And I pray if any are just kind of on the fence, Lord, with their faith, I pray now that today they would just fully commit to you and follow you all the days of their life and just have that, that great anticipation of your soon return. And so that, uh, that in every situation, as bizarre as things get in life around us, that we can look to you and that you're our anchor of faith, our anchor of hope. You're our lighthouse, Lord, you're the rock. You're the strong tower in our lives and the shield about us. So, Lord, we thank you that, that you're those things, that you're our savior. Lord, I pray that all of us get that, that we need a savior, not a helper, but a savior to deliver us completely and forever. So just bless the rest of our day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.